Right. Okay. Once again, welcome everybody to the Simcoe County Museum Black History Month virtual lecture series. As I said before, this is the first one this year, so we're, we're pretty excited. I'm pretty excited. This is my first one ever, so I'm pretty excited about it. And I'm also pretty excited about our speaker today. So our speaker today is Funke Ala Dejebi, and I have a little introduction before I pass it over to her. So Funke is a scholar of the 20th century with a specialization in Black Canadian history. Her book, Schooling the System, A History of Black Women Teachers, explores the intersections of race, gender, and access in Canadian educational institutions. She is also the co-editor of Unsettling the Great White North Black Canadian History. Her work explores the importance of Black Canadian women in sustaining their communities and preserving a distinct Black identity within restrictive gender and racial barriers. So thank you so much, Funke, for joining us. We're, I'm very excited. I'm sure everybody else is very excited. So I will actually pass it on over to you. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Meredith. And I'm going to just start sharing my screen so that folks can get a sense of some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Here we are. We should be good to go. Um, yeah, so I also I wanted to thank uh, Simcoe County uh, Museum and, of course, Meredith for this generous invitation to come join you all and to really talk about um, Black Canadian history, but particularly the things that I really like, which is around education, the history of education in Canada and its intersections with Black Canadian history and specifically Black women. But you all ha are lucky because there's been such a wonderful series of events that are coming up over the next couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to following and seeing what other speakers um, have to say about this great Black History Month discussion. So thank you all so much for joining. I'm so happy to talk to you all today. And as a historian of Black Canada and Black Canadian history, my desire um, continues to be to think about the ways we can bridge the spaces between academic and community knowledges. And this is really to think about how we can emphasize the necessity of discussing, speaking about, learning more about Black Canadian knowledges. And a lot of my work really centers around oral histories. And I think these oral histories are important avenues by which we can understand and situate advocacy work largely done by persons of African descent, but not exclusively, and their experiences within schooling systems, Canadian schooling systems. So I'm really excited to see, and I know that Simcoe County is continuing to engage in these conversations around uh, Black Canadian history more broadly. And even in preparation for my conversation today, I was trying to do some primary source digging around to see if I could find some of the educators um, in the region, and I was still having a really difficult time to do so. So I'm very much looking forward to um, what evolves from the Simcoe County space after this period. So um, in order to situate our conversation today, I'm going to be talking about, of course, the way in which Black women taught for liberation and the way in which their experiences in education systems really was really grounded in notions of liberation. In her analysis of missing Black self-representations in Canadian schools, Annette Henry describes the desire that Black Canadian communities had for liberatory practices where children of African descent were adequately supported in Canadian schools. In her work, Annette Henry defines African-centered education as a shift away from Western notions of knowledge and it also involves the way that we can reconceptualize education in order to include the experiences and lives of Black people. In a liberatory pedagogy or liberatory teaching, it represents not only the way that we can push against Eurocentric frameworks uh, in the Canadian curriculum, but it also considers the potential for Black self-representation. So the oral histories that I'm going to be featuring today are really trying to think through some of these concepts to give space for the importance of Black women's professional lives as educators and the way in which they served a fundamental and important component for how schooling institutions were restructured. Ultimately, I'm going to argue today that Black women teachers created various kinds of liberatory teachings to consider the place and the diversity of uh, black children and persons of African descent in Canada. So overall, as a result, in this presentation, I really emphasize the significance of self-definition and uh, the way in which black 
women's experiences in this work was important for helping us understand how they crafted spaces of inclusion, uh, particularly in learning spaces. And this wasn't just exclusive to Black students, but for all students. And in addition to this, I'm also going to be discussing the experiences of Black Canadian populations more broadly, but I'm also recognizing, of course, that these uh, Black experiences were incredibly diverse. So I'm including stories of Canadian-born, um, Caribbean-born, and of course, continental-born African populations who became um, part of the, the broader movement and placement of Black settlement across Canada. So I think in a lot of ways, my work and my research on Black education in Canada uh, was really thinking about um, women's experiences in Ontario schools, Black women's experiences in Ontario schools, particularly in the 20th century. And while this work doesn't strictly structure um, Black Canadian experiences solely in the past or in history, I'm really trying to draw these trajectories around how uh, the experiences of Black women teachers absolutely informs the way we think about ongoing structures around the Eurocentric curriculum, ongoing um, equity, diversity, and inclusion protocols happening across all of our institutions, and to go even further around residential schooling practices and the way in which Canada's education system, particularly for racialized communities, has often been marked by these um, experiences, right? These ruptures and experiences that are worth noting and I think worth talking about in these spaces. So if we take, for example, the experience of Ada Kelly, who is pictured here, who was born in Windsor, Ontario in 1893. And she became the first Black educator who was actually hired by the Windsor Board of Education in 1913. She was assigned um, to Mercer Street School, uh, where she earned an annual salary of about $600. And she later married Joseph R.B. Whitney, in 1919 in Windsor before moving to New York as a social worker. And Kelly's husband, Joseph, eventually became the editor for the Canadian Observer between, which had a relatively short uh, span between 1914 and 1919 in Toronto, which was ultimately a publication featuring the experiences of Black Canadians and particularly the ways in which they engaged and experienced forms of discrimination in Canada. And in so many ways, I think that there have been various museums and communities that collect the voices, the critical voices of women like Ada Kelly to tell us of their regional importance, but also of their provincial and national importance. And the way that these regional spaces offer us a critical way by which we can not only preserve Black Canadian history, but also think about the impacts that they had. So I think Ada Kelly's story offers uh, an important way that we can start to think about um, the way that Black Canadian experiences more broadly are rooted in various systems of education. The life of educators like Kelly can tell us not only of a collective Black Canadian experience that was often marked by sexism, separation, and racial discrimination, but they also tell us of individual actions and affirmations of professionalism and resistive pedagogies, liber liberatory teachings and approaches that often challenged mainstream stereotypes and assumptions about Black experiences in Canada. So my discussion then today will situate all of these approaches and of course use oral histories to help illuminate the voices of some of these early educators like Ada Kelly. By thinking about Black women teachers as active and conscious participants in Canada's education process in part of the Canada's nation building project, we can start to see and better understand interventions and the ways that we can contest settler colonialism that seeks to erase or ignore the presence of Indigenous and Black people across Canada. So it's really about how we can locate Black women as producers of knowledge and begin to uncover their everyday experiences and how they made these interventions over time and space. So for Black women educators, more specifically in the 20th century, there was a clear awareness about the economic realities that they faced uh, in the 20th century. And this 
meant that they entered uh, teaching and teacher training colleges at different moments of their lives. But really, they entered in the era of the more pronounced or more uh, predominantly in the end of the post-World War II period, where there was an ongoing teacher shortage. And this facilitated and allowed Black women to enter um, teacher training colleges and facilities at a greater rate. And while there were limited opportunities for what Black women could do, many of them often viewed teaching and their careers as teaching, as teachers, as a thing that they wanted to do, something that they were meant to do. Many of the women that I spoke to as part of this oral history, a part of the oral history sections of this work, often talked um, about their experiences around education as a calling. They often describe the way that they came to be educators as something that they always wanted to do. If we take, for example, Candace Gillum, who started teaching in 1963, largely because she believed that it was something she was always meant to do. When she finished high school, her parents actually paid for her admission into teacher's college. And it was here that she realized that it was a calling that she was always meant to do. Here she indicates, quote, I know it was something I was supposed to do in life. When I first started teaching, I knew for some reason, I don't know, I just fell into it, that I knew that it was what I was supposed to do and I loved it, I enjoyed it. Although Gillum, Gillum came to this realization after teaching in a classroom for the first time, she really expressed no discontent about being enrolled in teacher's college by her parents, but she also revealed that parental guidance and control often dictated her movement into the profession. As a young woman who was still residing in the home of her parents, the choices about where she would be working was compounded by familial expectations and what profession she should enter. Within Black communities, parents tended to stress education as an imperative for improving social and cultural status for Black community members, but they also viewed entering the professional workforce as an important tool for challenging discrimination. According to scholars like Karen Braithway and Carl James, they talk about the way that Black families and communities often hoped that education would increase the chances for a good job and enhance opportunities, and of course, allow Black communities to acquire cultural and social capital. And so since the entrance into the profession required additional training and certification beyond high school, it's not surprising that many Black parents view teaching as a positive career choice for their daughters. And this comes at a time when a lot of Black uh, Canadian communities often uh, were relegated into specific sectors and segments in um, Canadian society, particularly in labor. So a lot of women were employed predominantly as domestic uh, workers, but also sometimes in the professional space as nurses. So teaching offered a really important intersection in this moment for, for that. But it really isn't until this kind of growing student population and a teacher shortage in the 1950s across Ontario that we start to see this widening of admission requirements throughout Canada that allowed Black women specifically, who often had limited uh, opportunities to enter the labor force, to kind of gain training as teachers. And when they enter these um, these teacher training colleges, they come for a variety of personal and collective reasons. Some of these educators really entered the field because of the independence and the freedom that it offered. In other instances, they decided to attend because they believed it was their calling. And other women entered the field because there were restrictive opportunities elsewhere for them to enter the workforce. So while some women saw teaching as an opportunity to gain professional status and mobility, their entrance into the profession was also largely a result of wider and broader economic and social restrictions, which often limited the kinds of things that women can do and often segmented them into specific vocations. When I asked what she wanted to do after high school, one of the women I talked to, Blair Gittins, responded that, quote, I never cared about anything else but teaching. Since I was seven years old, all I could do was play school teacher and all I taught was mathematics. And while it is difficult to know about whether Gittin's uh, recollections was partially influenced by her knowledge of the project on Black educators, my, what I want to emphasize about her reflections 
is that she really believed in this notion of a calling, right? This idea that teaching was not only just work, it was an important vocation um, and something that Black women viewed as doing for their lifelong experience. So Black women's movement then into the professional teaching space then has to be understood in these really complex ways that within the context of limited education and employment opportunities for Black communities more broadly, teaching offered a way into different kinds of possibilities. Conscious of their positions within mainstream educational institutions, Black women then strategically negotiated ideas of access and identity. They obtained their certifications, they gained um, employment, and really built these professional networks that would both serve for individual and collective needs. And they used these opportunities that were available to them to respond to changing requirements in society, but also to plant themselves within the Canadian landscape. And yet, despite all of the challenges that came with entering the field around and amidst uh, larger discussions of racial discrimination, many Black women often talked about the ways in which they enjoyed their careers and their jobs and the responsibilities that came with their positions. Their presence and role within Canadian institutions, I think, directly challenges assumptions and conceptions about Blackness in Canada and their ability to overcome um, forms of discrimination within system, school systems. They were able to gain and obtain certification, find personal fulfillment as educators, and gain kind of professional um, accreditation. And so their reasons for entering their profession then was further reframed by the way in which they negotiated all of this. So in this slide, I've included the way in which I, you know, you can start to think in more complex ways about where you can locate and find Black educators. So here I've indicated um, some of the candidates who are standing outside of London Normal School, who are going to be graduating from, which was the teacher training college at the time in the 1940s. And here, of course, we can visibly see once we kind of look closely at the two Black educators who were uh, also training here. So a significant part of trying to uncover the stories of Black women teachers is really about where we can locate them. And a lot of times there is this assumption because of the way that geographic spaces have been positioned that Black educators taught you know, sometimes exclusively in Black schools. That was part of the story, but they were also teaching in um, predominantly diverse schools as well. And this became an important part of their story. But Black women also remained firmly grounded in personal, familial, and community networks when, and that this facilitated their ability to both enter the field of education, but also remain educators. So the decision to then enter teaching and the teaching profession was also partially due to a desire to enter a relatively small but important circle of Black professional women. These groups of women were some who were already teachers, some of them were recent graduates, and some of them were women who were looking for different careers, seeking a shift somewhere else, and some of them often encouraged women to come and enter the teaching profession. So these female-centered spaces of career networks provided information that detailed um, information around hiring and recruitment practices. It also persuaded other teachers to become educators. And in some instances, it also provided financial resources and accommodations in order to ensure women's success as teachers and educators. When Nicolette Archer, a resident in, of course, the Essex County area, was encouraged by one of her friends to enroll in Teachers College, she tapped into an already existing career network of women that stemmed long from community relationships across Black communities. Born in 1943, Archer's family had actually moved to North Buxton, moved from North Buxton to Windsor in 1948. And here she grew up in a predominantly Black neighborhood and community that comprised of wartime housing developments, where most of the men in the area worked for Chrysler, General Motors, and the Ford Motor Company. And according to Archer at the time, the employment of several Black men in these factories and industrial institutions really translated to community stability. And it also encouraged a series of uh, support systems that were evolved across and allowed to foster community cohesion. So Archer reported ultimately that 
community members knew each other and they knew the children. And of course that community members were then supervised by the women in the community who were known then as the McDougal Street mothers. And this really became an important way by which educators then remained connected, but they also learned where to apply to teachers' colleges, where, which schools were hiring and okay with hiring Black educators. And so it really came at an important and significant time in Black women's lives. So Archer's assessment then of the community really aligned with broader gender ideologies that equated male employability with stability, but it also reflected the correlation between motherhood, femininity within Black communities that nurtured children to enter uh, these community spaces and of course become activists themselves. So when Archer is re recollecting her reason, the reasons why she decided to become an educator, she says this really fascinating kind of story. She says, um, she recalls in a conversation about it, she says, well, my friend asked, where are you going next year? I said, I don't know. She said, well, she had already been to London Normal School for a year because when you get, came out of grade 12, you went to teacher's college for two years. When you got out at grade 13, you went for one year to be a teacher. I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, well, girl, you better apply to teacher's college because they're opening one in Windsor. And that was in 1962. I applied three days before the deadline and that's how I got in. When you think about the closely connected neighborhoods and relationships that Black women had with each other, these community relationships helped people like Archer learn about their community and education programs that were available to, to Black women. But her discussion with her friend also connected her to other Black women who were had similar goals and aspirations for social and economic independence. And ultimately, it reflected this kind of flexible enter, entrance requirements that allowed Black women to bas basically enter these female systems of support. Another woman that I spoke to, ja Jackie Morris, talked about this network uh, in Teachers College in 1961 when she had an aunt that was in the city, particularly in Toronto. She says, well, I lived with my aunt and I was very close to my cousins. So it was just like being with family. Being with family meant that Jackie had and could buttress herself against the negative elements of the city. She didn't have to navigate the city alone, but she also had various kinds of material supports like food and supplies that would help her while she was gaining training in teacher's college. So in addition to this, teachers' colleges and these programs and the few Black women who were there offered a space by which Black women could connect with one another, could sustain themselves, and of course, build a professional network. So surprisingly, when I was looking at um, teachers' college yearbooks to try and uncover and create a database for where Black educators might be, because a lot of school boards and institutions actually didn't collect race and gender-based um, data. And so a lot of times, uncovering or trying to find the number of how many Black women teachers were in various school systems was really difficult. But when you start reviewing the yearbooks, you actually see there were several Black women who were gaining training during this period, um, moving out to other schooling and school institutions in the era. And this became a fundamentally important way by which Black women's contributions informed right, their place and their belonging. And here I've highlighted in this slide an image of the Honorable Jean Augustine, who immigrated to Toronto in the 1960s under what was called at the time the West Indian Domestic Scheme. She eventually graduated from Teachers College in 1964 and worked at as a school teacher, vice principal and principal before deciding to move into different career paths. But she's most important and remembered for being the first Black uh, Canadian woman to be elected into the House of Commons in 1983. And of course, she became the parliamentary secretary for Prime Minister Jean Chrétien the following year. So Jean Augustine has had this illustrious kind of career that have made significant contributions, including the introduction and supporting the recognition of Black History Month across Canada. So there is all of these ways in which Black women started their careers as educators, really thought forcefully about the place of education in helping to support and engage with Black communities, and also the ways that they can, could later contributed both politically uh, to the structures and infrastructures of Canada. So education really serves as this kind of interesting hub, important hub for 
uh, various kinds of community engagement for political and social change. So the ways then that Black educators interpreted and reinterpreted their lives within education systems often speaks to the multiple and fluid identities of Blackness within Canada. Theorists such as Heidi Mirza argue that Black women not only resisted racism in educational institutions, but they lived in other worlds. By this, they redefined and created their own understanding of identity and of Black womanhood. These worlds were often parallel to and at times worked against what it meant to be singularly defined as either Black or female. They were really thinking about the intersections of those experiences. And the presence and place of Black educators at the time also allowed them the ability to hold or occupy these in-between spaces. These are places that not only were um, areas where Black women had to teach largely Eurocentric curriculum because that was part of their job requirements, but it also allowed Black women the space to reinterpret this curriculum and to reflect in a more adequate way the experiences of racial minorities and, of course, to ultimately represent Ontario's diverse Black student population, many of whom were, of course, Black. For Black Canadian-born uh, educator Clara Tompkin, increasing access to Black student activism dramatically changed her psychological and even her aesthetic articulations of Black womanhood. Charting the impact of Black power politics and Black liberation rhetoric in her identity, she recalled in the 1960s that the 1960s were a time of learning, a learning about who she was and embracing her uniqueness as a Black woman, largely by professing it in various ways. And in my interview with her, she talks about, she says, quote, here I am, all this stuff is going on in the United States and I'm trying to read about it. I'm really, really outside of the whole thing. And I can remember what a life change it was. My ex-husband was very supportive of me being natural. This is in reference to having natural hair similar to um, the Afro that uh, Jean Augustine has in this image. But it was a major decision for me to stop straightening my hair and to go natural. That's when I met that guy, that Jamaican. That was my whole identity crisis period where I'm wearing dashikis, having a big Afro. And I had this one American professor who worked in, in geography and he often was on the enemies list in America. And I got a strange sense that our phones were being tapped, but it was such a liberatory moment for me. Topkin became part of a wave of black student activists and organizations at her university campus while she was training to be an educator. And despite the way in which a lot of black liberation movements have often been articulated through an African-American lens, and despite feeling that she was kind of outside or external to the African-American experience, her identity crisis revealed the ways in which black Canadian university students adopted an African diasporic cultural aesthetics and ideology, but also about the way in which they were engaging with each other in different ways. The fact that Topkin is able to think about different black Canadian activist circles, which allowed her to meet her radical Jamaican friend from Toronto, and allowed her to also engage with notions of Blackness, we start to see how Black educators were adding to these layered experiences and thinking in more complex ways about their own identi identities, even as they were becoming educators themselves. Topkin was also connected to these social justice movements um, that really thought about surveillance, satellites, encroachment, all of this became informed by how she then later approached teaching. And the fact that she embraced what was categorized at the time as culturally aesthetic African clothing, wore her hair natural, and read more books about Black history really articulates a time when Black women were starting to think more critically about their experiences. Topkin increasingly became uh, engaged in activist communities in her area, and she began advocating for more materials and accurate representations of Black history within her school library. Instead, for example, of placing the books on Black history in a clearly identifiable section in her uh, school library, what she actually does was she began merging stories about Black Canadian history and Black people more broadly and started including them in the Canadian history section. For example, Topkin categorized a book on John Harper's raid 
um, in the military history book section, right? These kind of subtle and everyday practices that women like Topkin did to insert Blackness as an everyday part of Canadian history. So Topkin explains, quote, John Brown came to Ingersoll, which was just outside of London, to try and recruit Black men to fight against slavery and the Harper Ferry's raid. Well, that's military. So I would just say, let's categorize this kind of history differently in a way that will really bring out the significance of it, end quote. Her efforts to recategorize Black Canadian history came directly from her early discussions, discussions and experiences with Black liberation and Black radicalism. She later worked to increase the availability of Black history materials in her school. She attended a series of community meetings and also worked for a growing organization in the city called the Black Education Project, which offered um, after school programs around Black history for students in uh, the school system. So wherever possible, Black educators were critically thinking about access, about ways to support uh, students within the school and external to the school, but they were also doing these everyday practices of changing the way that education was structured. And this became a really kind of important way of thinking about liberatory teaching and liberatory practices. So what I think then that Tomkin's story tells us is that Black women's involvement as educators can be understood as a constant back and forth between community and schools and institutions. She was conscious of her precarious position in education institutions, but she also strategically negotiated the complexity of Black Canadian identities that would serve diverse populations of people. Black women educators then often implemented these, a variety of these strategies to combat systems of anti-Blackness within Canadian schools. They often inserted the experiences, uh, Black experiences within individual classrooms, and they often took into account the communities by which their students lived and came from. At other times, they would encourage students to bring cultural artifacts for multicultural themed events. And they often advocated for Black studies programs and courses within the school board. So at multiple instances, liberatory teaching and liberatory practices were really thinking about how to change systems from within. In other instances, because um, few Black educators taught, sometimes Black ed women educators didn't teach large numbers of Black pupils, they often felt a particular closeness to the few Black students that in, they were engaged with and often sought to equip them with broader skills that they would have for society. They often looked out for students wherever possible and sometimes maintained rigid and high standards and expectations to help prepare students for the life that's called ahead. Many uh, scholars term this idea as warm demanders. That is, Black educators who used their authority and position in schools to better prepare Black pupils for social and systemic oppression that they would face outside. But they also worked to transform the immediate social conditions that students faced in ways that allowed uh, Black children to be encouraged and to see the potential and the ways in which you could enrich Black Canadian communities. And so the ability then for educators in these periods to augment the curriculum in their individual classrooms was an articulation of the ways that they understood the broader limitations in society, but also what kinds of interventions could be made. So I think all of this says that Black women educators experience various forms of discrimination in their schools, sometimes elements that were both overt and covert in nature. But even as mainstream institutions uh, sought out Black women educators for you know, changing student populations, Ontario schools continued in many ways to engage or have limited forms of inclusion. Black women teachers often remained connected to their communities and of course engaged in racial uplift and support. The Black Education Project was one of these organizations that emerged in the 1970s to try and but buttress a largely Eurocentric curriculum that often ignored Black contributions and the presence of Black people across Canada. And so the Black Education Project emerged as this after-school program where many Black educators taught at, 
And here they would provide um, important black history notes. They would take students on field trip to predominantly and historically black communities across Canada. In other instances, they would help teach parents how to communicate with school principals and administration. And it really became a community hub by which students um, could basically respond right, to the erasures that existed in the school curriculum themselves. And Black women activists became an incredible part of this movement to both speak out against the forms of anti-Black racism that students were experiencing in schools, but also to empower children, parents, and other educators about this kind of collective way that community could always be connected to school systems. So Black women in Canada then reacted and they adapted to the presence of racial and gender oppression in a variety of ways. At the center of their um, reactions and responses was really about the ways that they used and thought of and examined education as a tool for social transformation and community survival. Educational historians like Paul Axelrod remind us that educators did what they could and they did the work that they thought they could in classrooms within the parameters of a larger political culture and the dominant values of the time. As such, Black women participated in these everyday practices of liberation and resistance in ways that served to insert Blackness within mainstream institutions, which became a central part of their activism and, of course, the way in which they thought about their own lives. So what do we make then of these smaller, more undocumented experiences? Well, I think that these moments created ruptures in institutional environments and school settings. They created spaces by which to unsettle the notions of who got to be Canadian and instead reimagined it from the framework of Black Canadian identities. So my presentation today is really trying to situate or at least start to give you um, the richness of Black experiences, both from a historical perspective, but also to think about the contemporary ways that the lives and experiences of Black Canadians don't stand in isolation from these larger movements and programs um, for education. Whenever I, I, I speak in, in this, everyone has, uh, when I speak at these kinds of broader discussions, everyone has right a story about an educator or a teacher that they spoke to or had an impact on their lives, whether it was negative or positive, and the role that that played in um, facing or navigating the trajectory by which they were going. So I think the presence and role then of African descended peoples, of black populations within various uh, school systems directly challenged these um, gender-based and race-based assumptions. And it also allowed us to see different ways of being. Many of the examples uh, in the history of education then also tell us about a continuum of black Canadian activism and the resistance to political and social and economic limitations that existed in uh, the post-World War II era. These experiences were connected to community survival, but also they stood as a way of subverting mainstream institutional mandates that often denied or even rejected Black participation from the nation building project. project. So Black Canadian populations and Black women teachers understood themselves within these dominant discourses that's often sought to silence or hide their experiences. And they also rooted and grounded their activism in thinking about what it meant to live and exist as a Black person within these spaces. So I think in order to kick, kick off much of these conversations today, I think these events, um, the presence and the contributions that Black women made remind us that Black Canadians had diverse ways of being and that sometimes these engagements were contradictory, sometimes they were complex, but they all helped to shape the way in which we think about education and schooling more broadly. Black women's impact more globally, globally not only stood in response to these broader social contexts, but also articulated what was possible, the possibility of a liberatory pedagogy. So thank you. I guess we'll, we can open it up for broader questions or a discussion or uh, anything. I'm, I'm actually surprised by how good my timing was. I was like trying to stay pretty close to that. Awesome. <laughs> 
I'll stop because I have to pee. Yeah, so is there anybody that has any questions? You can feel free. Your uh, mic is on the top toolbar. You can uh, mic yourself or you can put your question in the chat. Your presentation was just so thorough. <laughs> Perfect, Jess, you have a question? I do, um, a bit of a question and a comment. So first of all, what a great presentation. It was just so interesting and um, so uplifting. And I think that uh, that history continues today um, in terms of um, black educators broadening kind of the scope of education and bringing in different parts of community connection and all those things that you just said. Um, and my question is more about modern, like not historical, but now. Um, and it's really a question for one of my best friends who was trying to attend today, but it doesn't look like she made it. So I'm going to ask it for her. Um, and she is a black educator herself who's currently unable to work because the workplace is so psychologically unsafe for her. Um, and so she's off work. And so do you have any, I don't know, recommendations, thoughts, words of wisdom for the way forward for people who are still facing racism in the school boards today? Uh, thank you so much for that question. That that continues to be an ongoing thing. So a thing that I didn't highlight, for example, in some of the stories that I recollected of Black women educators were, of course, the psychological damaging and very traumatic experiences that they also engaged with and experienced in school settings. And while I alluded to some of these more subtle practices, I actually don't think they were quite subtle as, at all. Many of the educators that I spoke to, and, and in some instances, they were at the highest levels of the profession. I'm talking principals and super in, in, um, superintendents who were perceived of as being less than qualified, who were deliberately um, undermined in school settings or faced deep, deep isolation in everyday practices of the staff room. So in my research, I actually found that the staff room was a place um, by which a lot of violence actually incurred. Uh, these were spaces where, for example, people often exchanged broader stereotypes about Black students. Um, these were places where Black educators were isolated or made to not feel as part of the teaching collective. And if anyone has ever been an educator, like the best way I can describe it is that teachers are like, they function in packs, okay? And they kind of have fun together, they eat lunch together, they share knowledge and expertise. And so the, it, it can be a really positive space or a really negative place if you're at, um, isolated. And the Black women I talked to historically did it in a series of ways. One is that they ended up creating or engaging with larger community education programs and organizations because of course they just felt the, the levels by which they experienced hostility in the school structures was not well. They also created programs, right? External programs for themselves by which they emphasized and leaned in on Black Canadian experiences. Uh, and then they created these, and so they found these systems and pockets of by which to find survival, joy, and support. In other instances, they leaned pretty heavily on the institutions that actually were there. Um, sorry, I think my... Headset was going off. Okay. Can y'all still hear me? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, it was looking like my headset was going in and out. But um, so they also were actively trying to um, push against this. So some women, you know, used the union particularly to advocate. But even then, the Federation of Women Teachers Association at the time was fraught with its own kind of systemic forms of racism and discrimination. And so sometimes even these institutions were not helpful. Um, and so there are these broader ways and a lot of them also went to the Ontario Human Rights Commission. And you know there are these kind of systemic ways that are inadequate. There are these external processes that are also not adequate. And so black women sit really at this in-between sector where they don't always get the kinds of supports that are necessary and have often had to do or lean in on the resources that exist in their own communities, which I don't think is the same kinds of experiences that happens to all educators, right? I think that there is a, a mechanism by which Black women face a particular kind of isolation in school settings that often creates problems. So I don't know if I have a, an answer for you because I think to answer the question, would to, uh, fully to answer the question, would not be honest. 
about the limitations of the broader systems themselves. I think there are mechanisms that are more mechanisms in place now that you can use internally to advocate for these forms of discrimination that are happening in individual uh, schools. But I don't think that that actually solves or resolves the problem of um, the kinds of psychological impacts that that happens, right? So for the women that I spoke to, they kind of don't get over it fully, right? And, and you know how I know that is that 50 years later, 30, 40 years later, they recall this instance of violence or they recall this instance that was deeply hurtful to them. So the fact that over time and space, they can, that these things linger with them, I think is alluding to a broader challenge that Black women face, this notion that they must per, you know, persevere, move through the challenges of it, but they have a, a cost, right? to their well-being, to their health, to their mental health. And that continues to remain the same. Um, some Black women, of course, who had the capacity, economic stability, spoke to therapists, specifically attuned to anti-Black racism. Um, they often took leaves when they needed to. And so these are some mechanisms by which some of them enacted their own kind of individual forms. But I absolutely don't think those things are enough for the kinds of individual experiences, because what comes with that is, of course, broader stereotypes that you're difficult, right, that you're not interested in engaging in school systems. And so in some ways, it also re, um, repurposes these broader systems of isolation that don't always get resolved. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we okay. can hear you, John. Okay, I think I'm the only guy here. Um, anyway, yeah, great, great talk. I really, uh, really appreciate that. And uh, I just wanted to follow up on uh, what uh, I think it was just the, the lady just before us asking the question about uh, her friend who was also a black, uh, I, I take it a female educator and and her, uh, I guess, feeling of, uh, you know, psychologically unsafe uh, to be involved in that environment as, as we're sitting today. So I guess my first question is, uh, you know, without getting anybody on the spot, but give me an example of what, what that is, psychologically unsafe in a teaching environment. And the other question that sort of comes up in my mind is that I was just reading today that uh, the education minister in Ontario, uh, Lacey, uh, he's putting, or not him uh, in particular, but his uh, educational department is putting together a, uh, I don't know how he's framing it, something as a black education go into the school system. I think it starts in grade six and grade eight, and then it jumps to grade 10. Um, yeah, um, instituting Black history uh, programming into the curriculum because that hasn't existed. Yeah, yeah. so is this, mm -hmm. you know, so can we tie those two things in? Like this psychologically unsafe if for, a, for a, a Black teacher in the school environment today. Now that is alarming to me. And now you're turning that around and within that environment, we are going to teach Black history. Uh, is this going to be a whitewash? Like, you know, I, we've got so much coming in from the U.S. right now, and you know what's going on down there. Like, that, they they don't want to teach their Black history. And right. Oh, you know, I'm 68 years old, grew up in Nova Scotia, and uh, I know the history down there of you know some of the Black history. It, it's not nice, and yeah. you have to go looking for it. It's not. Uh, so I guess I'll leave it there. I don't want to keep talking, but. Uh, is there going to be an issue there? Are we going to get a whitewash history because of the psychological, you know? Well, let's, um, I'll, I'll answer your, your question in two parts. Um, so I'll answer the psychologically unsafe part about things that have happened to me every day, for example, um, as a professor in, in a university, right? Um, more often than not, I'll, I'll be going to a staff room or a place um, where I'm clear, I clearly look like an educator, where I clearly have the key and the code to the staff room. And inevitably, someone will ask me, are you coming to my class? So they'll assume, for example, that I'm not supposed to be an, a professor or someone who works in this institution, that I'm actually a student. 
So there are these subtle ways that people kind of undermine your qualifications. But um, exactly. some of the more violent examples in from the women that I actually spoke to was really around um, experiences. So for example, one of the Black educators that I spoke to had a actively advocated for a Black student in the school who was experiencing deep, deep anti-Black racism from a white educator at the time and had approached the principal about this issue and talked to them. And then the next day found a death threat or a, a threatening note in her um, her mailbox, the staff mailbox. And the and when she was recalling the story, she was so uncomfortable to speak about it. If visibly she she was unsettled, right? And it took me a lot of time to kind of get. She even refused to tell me that someone had um, spoken these violent kind of words in in. The, she couldn't tell me that she refused to tell me the details of the letter, right? Um, and a lot eventually, of trauma. yeah, a lot of trauma there, right? So she eventually says that she went through a series of practices and moved it up uh, the chain, and that um, one of her white colleague, male colleagues, that she really like was a really good friend of hers, had actually written that letter, this anonymous um, letter, and he was of course removed from the school. But what ended up happening to her was that she was like, I felt that all of the people that I thought I trusted that we were all here together, I couldn't, right? I kind of turned inwards and I couldn't engage in any healthy ways. I felt super unsupported, right? And so there are ways in which these kind of everyday elements seep into how Black women engage every day. And that I think particularly was psychologically traumatizing for her, even though she would never describe it that way because of all of the terrible things that happened to her. So there are these moments where they can be quite on the extreme and in much the same ways that I think Jess is saying, right? That what happens when you your principal, for example, um, articulates a lot of uh, anti-Black racism or discrimination, um, this is someone that you're gonna be reporting to and how do you do that? Or if an, if an educator shares, right? Stereotypical um, views about Black students, all these kinds of things, deeply, deeply embedded practices of prejudice that are often difficult to uproot. So I, I power, also saw the power, power structure there as well. You know? Power, everything, right? These are these are all embedded into the the practice and the curriculum. I also saw this this notice very recently as you were talking today that the across Ontario, um, Lecce is of course uh, in the in the Department of Education is um, seeking to make mandatory Black History uh, Month program not Black History Month but Black History programming in the curriculum across Ontario. And I think the potential of this is that there are tons of educators who are already and have been writing, you know, curriculum emphasizing Black Canadian history from an affirming lens, from an honest lens, from a critical lens. So I think there are lots of educators already out there engaging in the curriculum and the work, um, engaging in the history of Black Canadian experiences from a critical uh, lens and critical race lens. So I think there is um, all of that already in place. I think the challenge. Does it, does it, I hate to interrupt you though, but does it does it really exist? Like this is one of the. There's a, there's a couple of. Uh, I was uh, before I was coming on, and I went into some of the lectures that were on the Simco program last year, mm -hmm. and there was one thing that really stuck in my mind because I'm up in Barrie, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was to do with the. It was to do with the uh, Oral Medanti. Uh, apparently, you know, back in the late uh, 19th century, a, a, a large group of. Uh, of blacks came and settled in Oro, were given land grants, mm -hmm. and were successful farmers and had, a, you know, had a very, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I know the story. Is, uh, yeah, very, uh, you know, productive uh, communities and society going on. And then in comes the influx of the white settlers, and all of a sudden they just disappear. There, there's uh, there's no history of it. They don't. I kept asking the question like, where do they go? Well, we don't know where they went. Right. Why would they sell their land to all these white settlers when they had profitable firms? So that, that to me just raises big red flags, right? Because uh, you know you know what was going on in other parts of Canada. These were not. Right. Uh, they just didn't walk in and say, "Oh, we'd like you to sell our land, and wouldn't it be nice if you give it to us?" They went and took it, and it was violent. Yeah, um, absolutely. I totally think that um, all of those things are true, right? I think. Um, but I do think there are the, the history does exist for the for the Black Canadian uh, context, right? And it's continuing to evolve. People are continuing to uncover 
even more evidence in history of Black Canadian experiences. I think the challenge for this mandatory curriculum will be um, who, how everyone takes it up, right? A lot of times when we've been thinking about Black history in Canada, the expectation is that only Black educators um, are the ones who should be doing this work. But it's a responsibility for all of us to be engaging in um, equitable teaching, right? And that means exactly. that we, in much the same ways that we're teaching, teaching about Irish immigration to Canada or Indigenous histories in Canada, we should be doing the same for Black Canadian history so that it's just an integrated part of how we think. And that it doesn't only have to be when we pick up an English literature book. It can also be about the examples that we use in math or science. Um, so that we are using, we're talking about Black inventors, we're talking about Black Black mathematicians, all of which um, inform how students learn in general. So I think it offers the potential, but there is, of course, a danger about broader anxieties, broader stereotypes that is ever present, right? So we are, it's going to be interesting to track over the next couple of years what, what might be, because I think that that's a, you're raising like a legitimate, legitimate concerns and legitimate flag, uh, red flags around what um, what has been and what the potential danger for for these broader stereotypes is. Yeah, so hopefully there's individuals like yourself and the other that are going to step up because I, you know, I can't imagine the uh, the white community stepping up and protecting you. So uh, hopefully there's enough of the black educators that will step in there and, uh, and put a little I think force so. on it. I think so. And the women that I talked to also talked about how they had amazing relationships with lots of like uh, white educators um, who were also like all invested right in changing the school systems and doing good things. So I think anywhere we go, we have a lot of potential to support each other. And it's just a matter of like how we want to do it, you know. Um, so that is <laughs> we'll see. We're going to follow and see. But yeah, I appreciate that, John. Thank you very much. So I actually. Oh, sorry, John. I actually had a couple more comments. So Cheryl commented saying, thank you so much for oh. such an informative and thought provoking presentation. It is very unsettling to hear that racism is, racism, sorry, is still prevalent in our education system where equality should be taught and celebrated. A long way to go. Thank you for your passion and dedication to this important and neglected part of our history. And then we also had thank Ellen you. said many thanks for your presentation. Um, Melissa said, thank you so much for speaking. And Karen said, thank you for sharing your information with us today. today. Um, and just on my behalf, thank you so much. So on my behalf and the Simcoe County Museum, thank you so much. As we, uh, many people have said, this is a really important part of history and I think it should be shared. And we really appreciate that there are people out there like you that can share it to us. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for these comments and questions. And yeah, let's just continue to engage in all things um, diverse black history so that we can constantly keep learning. So uh, shout out to, you know, Simcoe County Museum for doing all of this and constantly allowing the space for us to think through these ideas and to learn from each other. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, everybody, you have a fantastic day and feel free to join us for any of our future lectures this month. Thank you.